Hi, guys. I'm Nicolette Amino with Insomnicat Media, and I have got Brian DeLuca here with me. And today we are talking to Lauren Wheaton, president of Sprout Public Relations, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the public relations field, a little bit about what she does, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that relates to content. So, um, hi, Lauren. How are you? Hi, good. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Sure. So um, I am actually one of those rare people who uh, does what I went to school for. Um, I graduated in uh, 2003 from the University of Florida with a, a degree in public relations and uh, started working about, I think, a day and a half after graduations at a PR agency. So I, was, I was very lucky to land a job back then. Um, and so I was at the agency, um, do, it was kind of a mid-sized agency representing clients from like local, regional, and national levels um, from 2003 until 2012-ish. Um, and around the time when I had my son, I decided to become a, uh, a solo PR practitioner and started my own firm um, to afford me a little bit more flexibility with the kids. And, um, so I've been doing this for almost, I gulp when I think about this, almost 20 years now, which is crazy. Um, I mm -hmm. a little bit of time in, um, in college because I was doing some internships and stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's been a fun ride. Um, I, one of the reasons I love it and continue to do it is because it's different every day. Um, I get to work with an array of clients that teach me something new all the time. Um, and over time, I've really kind of grown into the role and feel very comfortable in, in what I do in PR. So one of the things I thought might be helpful is to um, spend a couple of minutes defining PR because I think there's a lot of confusion about what public relations professionals do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I always hark back to the Public Relations Society of America. It's a, a long-standing organization that many professionals belong to throughout the country, and we've even got an international presence. And um, so I thought I would kind of give you the definition as they define it, which is public relations is a strategic communication process that builds mutually beneficial relationships between organizations and their publics. Um, some of the key factors of public relations um, and maybe differentiators from other forms of communications. Uh, PR is usually going after unpaid or earned media. Um, so, you know, we're trying to influence opinions. We're trying to get messages out via, um, via tools and, and communications mechanisms that wouldn't necessarily be paid for. So not like a, a pay to play television segment, not an advertisement. Um, again, kind of an earned media opportunity. Um, the other thing I think is really important is um, the, the notion of two-way communications. So there's this, um, this perception of PR, and, and I think you know, largely what a lot of PR professionals do and are known for is you know, media relations, um, but that can actually be a two-way street. So um, in addition to sharing information with the publics uh, with the media who are going to be targeting your audiences. Um, you can also get feedback from them and from your audiences in, in, in you know, indirect ways. Um, and I think it's important for PR professionals who are operating strategically to bring that information back into the organization that you're representing just so that they um, they're getting that other side of the story because a lot of times I think we can um, we can fall into the trap of just trying to disseminate our messages and not really listening. But I think that PR professionals have a, a really critical role in that listening function and in bringing that back to the the CEOs, the the people in an organization that make a difference. Can Can you explain a little? Can you? kind of elaborate on that a little bit more about the listening and that that side of the communication? Yeah, so I think a lot of times, um, and especially like a lot of entry level professionals can fall into this, um, you know, there's, there's just this notion that we're going to be pushing out messages. And so whether that's a new product launch or whether you've got a new campaign going, um, I think that there's this 
you know, this perception that we can just send out the messages that we want and expect to get coverage on that. Um, sometimes it works out as nicely as that, but often I think you need to be paying attention to what's trending in whatever industry you're in, um, paying, you know, when you're building relationships with your audiences, whether that be through the media or directly, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to spend time actually building and maintaining that relationship. And sometimes that's hearing that what you're pitching isn't necessarily something that they're interested in. And so it's finding out what they are more interested in, um, seeing if there's a way to fit into that story and bringing that back to the, um, to the executives, to the marketing folks at your organization so that they can understand what is newsworthy, what's topical at the time. Right. So are you, are you really doing, um, so say for instance, you're working with a company and w whatever it's about, whether it's a, a technology or a product or a person or an event happening for that company, are you then going in and looking at, at okay, so here, here are, here, you know, based on that, here's what's trending and here's really what assets or what media companies you're going to go after in order to get that release in front of, or is it, you know, where it's, you're really targeting it and honing it in. Or is it also partially like a shotgun approach where you'll put it through like, you know, some of the, some of the, you know, media sites like uh, PR Newswire or something, mm -hmm. you know, is that really based on client or based on what, um, you know, what, what the, really the goal or the target is from the, the, the client themselves? Yeah, I, I think that one of the hallmarks of, of a good PR strategy is to really tie your, um, your objectives and your goals into the overarching business objectives and goals. And so, mm -hmm. um, so approaching it in, in a more targeted way is usually the best way to go about it. Um, I, I haven't had a ton of success just doing those like blanket, you know, wire distribution. Right. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that means that the, the quote unquote media you're targeting are not traditional media. Sometimes, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. a, honest conversation with a client to say, hey, if XYZ is our goal, then the New York Times is probably not the best mechanism for getting, you know, getting to that goal. Maybe it's right. out to, um, you know, to bloggers who have some influence in that sphere. Maybe it's, maybe it's a direct mail campaign. I mean, it, it's just a matter of trying to figure out who the right audience is to hear that message and, and what you want them to do with the message and then um, kind of deciding the tactic from there. But yeah, there's a lot of listening that goes on even on social media um, before I will make a suggestion to a client. I'll spend time just kind of looking at who the influencers are in that space and what they're talking about. Um, so you can really easily do that and, and you know, obviously for free, um, spend some time on Twitter, mm -hmm. spend some time just like Google news alerts, trying to see what's, you know, how you can fit into that story. Gotcha. So, so now when you when you're when you're doing that and you're you're really looking at that singular approach, right? You mentioned, or not a singular approach, but you're looking at very targeted approaches, right? So you're looking at dealing with some, you know, some publications or bloggers or influencers, which is really nice to hear because we don't usually hear that from a lot of the PR companies that yeah. they're focused on influencers because it's one of the things we focus on a lot. So that's actually great to hear. My question is, um, so you also mentioned doing direct mail. So are you also helping the companies actually uh, even gear the message for their own audience that they've already aggregated for themselves? Like if they have their own mailing list, whether it be, you know, some investor news or some users that have signed up for, you know, their newsletter or some other alerts on their site? In a lot of cases, PR professionals are looked to for that function. It really just varies on the organization um, and how large the PR function is or how large their marketing communications department is. Um, sometimes there are PR professionals who are strictly focused on external communication. Sometimes there are PR professionals that are strictly focused on media, you know, just even a, a smaller component of that, which is media relations. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of times um, it makes sense to have somebody at the, you know, the head table and like a chief marketing officer role or, or a chief communications officer role so that they understand the larger, kind of going back to my, my other point, understand the larger business objectives and how PR and marketing and various functions of communications can fit into that. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times I, my clients are looking to me for, uh, for, you know, even just review of some of the messaging that's going out to other audiences that aren't necessarily targeted through, you know, a media campaign or something like that. Um, Cause it, it, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want to be putting out one thing to one audience and then saying something completely different to somebody else. So again, it kind of depends on the size and scope of the organization and, and how large the communications function is, but there are definitely, you know, I'm a, like I said, I'm a solo practitioner now and, and I think a lot of my clients lean on me for, Kind of review and approval of all of the messaging that goes out. Gotcha. So what would you tell somebody who doesn't see the value in hiring a PR professional? Because you did talk about the confusion there and, and you know the need to really define what they do. So for those who who don't quite understand, you know, what what would you tell them? So there's a, a couple of quotes that PR professionals tend to go back to because of who said them. Um, we've, uh, Bill Gates mm -hmm. at one point said, um, if I was down to my last dollar, I'd spend it on public relations. Uh, and then Sir Richard Branson similarly said, publicity is absolutely critical. A good PR story is infinitely more effective than a front page ad. So, you know, I, I think, you know, leaning on these brilliant business minds that um, anybody in the C-suite, you know, knows these names to let them know how much, um, how much they place, you know, how much value they place on PR is usually a good starting point. Um, but, uh, and I'm sorry to keep harping back on this, but one of the things that um, over time I've learned has been very critical to my clients is to, again, kind of tie back to their business objectives. And a lot of times they're thinking of PR as, um, as something that's much smaller than, than it really could be. Uh, so they're thinking, you know, well, my, my niece's cousin could do social media posts, you know, why, why would I need to hire somebody? In right. or, or, um, or it's just a matter of. Well, you know, we, we, really we, we find that a lot too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we find that a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that I've started doing is kind of reframing it more as reputation management. Um, so you'll hear that a lot more often um, in some of the higher echelons of public relations to start saying that, you know, this isn't necessarily just publicity or this isn't necessarily just community relations, but we're taking a look, a very close look at the organization's entire reputation. And we're seeing how we want to shift that if we, and, Indeed, want to shift it, and we, we're seeing how this is being communicated to our audiences. Um, one of the things I think we also try to do when we're trying to convince somebody the value of PR is to rely on that um, the importance of third-party credibility. So, you know, I, I think that most people understand that you know, a, a, well, back to Sir Richard Branson's quote: "A front-page ad is something that you can pay for." Um, and that's obviously going to get your messages across exactly the way you want to. But when you get a front page story on um, uh, within a publication or on a media outlet that is important to your target audiences, that's somebody else kind of helping to tell your story for you. So that's mm -hmm. really that, that, that whole notion of third party credibility um, is a very critical component when you're trying to sell somebody on the value of PR. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, you know, you were talking about was kind of, it depends on, it depends on the company, it depends on their objectives, you know, whether you're going to, you know, do more than just the traditional things that PR professionals are thought to do. But one of the things that we've been seeing is PR agencies kind of evolving their strategy to incorporate content in content development, you know, content marketing. And I mean, we, we've all worked together before, you know, we all know how, right. how important content marketing is. So, you know, I mean, for us, you know, that that's a really important, important thing. So where are you seeing this now in PR? Are more clients coming to, to PR agencies and, and asking for content development? So I have to admit, I've been out of the traditional agency game for some time now, and I'm more, um, you know, the solo practitioner. Um, and I get a lot for content development. I would say one of the key elements that's starting to go missing in the newer generations of, of um, 
anybody in the communications realm really is there's just not a really good focus or um, emphasis on the importance of good writing and, and good editing. Um, and so content development, no matter how you're you know, approaching it, that you really need to have those basic foundational elements. Um, in terms of what the industry has been seeing, I would say probably within the past 10 or so years, there has been a marked shift um, in any sort of professional development setting in, in the PR realm um, towards this concept of new media. Um, so again, we're kind of breaking things down into like the traditional media, which would be like you know, more, uh, you know, print publications, radio stations, um, some broadcast, um, and, and now into this realm of new media, uh, which includes, you know, of course, social media, includes things like podcasts, it includes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just anything, this content development, um, you know, blogging, that sort of thing. So there's been a real shift in the way that PR practitioners are being asked to think. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's being driven by the clients and organizations as much as we're the ones bringing it to them to try to help them understand the value of it. Um, maybe that's going to change over time, but I still think there's, um, amongst the C-suite, there's still a lot of emphasis pay placed on, you know, I want to touch and feel like a hard media clip. You know, I want to be able to show this at a point right. that we're getting these metrics. And so um, it's mm -hmm. important. And one of the things that I think content marketing does well that PR has always struggled with is being able to pull metrics and to show somebody how it's working. Right. Um, again, when you're tying things back to a business objective um, and you can start to say like, this is how many people within our targeted audience saw our, our messages and you know, this is how it's funneling into our lead system, um, then you can really show the value of, of going after quote unquote new media in that way. Right. So how, how are they measuring it? Right. With all, you know, cause we all know, you know, that marketers have gotten a lot more savvy over the last decade in terms of measuring it and, you know, nurturing and things like that, especially with the social piece, you know, they're measuring how many things are coming in. So how do they measure public relations? Like, so if you have a project, do they go, Oh, wow, you got me into three publications. That's a success. Or you got me in front of, um, you know, 3 million eyeballs because you got me on this blog and on this website, or are they measuring it in like very traditional things like conversions or, or, you know, pieces like that? How do they actually measure? Cause we know they have the tools to measure these things. You know, most big companies are measuring their results. So from a PR perspective, how do they do that? It's pretty easy when it's content, right? But from a PR perspective, how are they measuring you guys as a success if a campaign is success? Yeah, um, so that's been evolving over time too. And I think different organizations measure things in different ways that are more important to them. Um, there are still some very traditional subsets that want like an advertising equivalency rate, which has always been kind mm -hmm. of a strange way of, of measuring PR anyways. Uh, um, for anybody who's not familiar, it's literally like measuring the size of an article you get in a publication and then comparing it to what a size, um, that a similarly sized ad would cost in that same publication. Um, and so that, you know, there's still some people who like that kind of measurement. Um, more and more though, I think PR professionals are being challenged um, both at an industry level and by their client bases to tie back into organizational objectives. So it is looking at things like, you know, are we, are we converting what we, you know, we said six months ago that we were going to try to get mm -hmm. in the XYZ publications in front of these audiences. Um, are we converting those into more eyeballs on the site? Are we converting those into right. leads in our system? Um, and so we are trying to, to measure ourselves um, in ways like that now. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've heard that I think is really, um, it's really a good measurement for us is looking at, um, share, I've heard of share of voice, but um, I heard recently mm -hmm. another one that was share of discussion. And I really like that um, because I think that when, when we're putting the, um, the company's messages out there, it's important to, to know, you know, 
are we leading the discussion? Are we just a part of the discussion? Um, are, you know, are there other players in the space that we can um, work alongside? Are we competing with other players in that space? So I think start sort of taking a hard look at how we're doing in the overall discussion of what, you know, whatever the campaign is about is, um, is another mm -hmm. metric. And it's one that some people, you know, some of the, the paid sites are starting to measure more of. I mean, you can usually, um, you know, break it down when you're looking at some of these metrics uh, platforms, you know, if how you're doing in terms of the share of the discussion. So, so when you say share of discussion, are they just measuring, um, say, for instance, it's, uh, you know, it's XYZ company, right? So are they just measuring, okay, we, we're starting to get more search traffic in on XYZ company because we've dominated that discussion. People are going away. Maybe they read something somewhere. They're coming back. And they're searching for that company, or is it we're you know we're in the um, you know uh, electric car market, right? You know we make we make electric vehicles, and now people are more going and they're searching for electric vehicles, and they're coming to us. Are they looking at it from the the aspect of just their company brand or sort of the products they're developing? Um, I more traditionally I see it in the products they're developing. So for instance. Uh, I have worked with an organization that um, that is in the kind of like meditation, like online meditation app space. Um, and so there are some. I, de I, de I definitely, I definitely need that. I'll tell you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some big players that have been around for a long time in that space, and so um, their metric in terms of what they thought, um, you know, how how PR was doing was to start to capture some of that share of discussion. So, um, so it was, you know, literally seeing, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's platforms that will do this, but combing the internet to see like our bloggers talking about our company more, um, our right. you know, mm -hmm. publications, so and yeah, even they're... when they are talking about them, is it a positive statement? Is it a negative statement? Right. And is it neutral? Right. Or... What about so they're using a lot of social listening. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Of. Like, yeah. I'm sure many do hashtag campaigns, and then you can kind of track some sort of measurement there. Um, yeah, you know. Yeah, there's all kinds of different, you know, ways to go about measuring the share of discussion. But usually, it comes down to, you know, how well are you doing in the space that you're, um, you know. How, how are you kind of usurping your competitors in that space or are you um right. are you gaining the most um over them so i have i have another actually you know what I, I have a fun question if that's okay with you i i wanted to know <laughs> um what are what have been your favorite p r moments over the course of your career oh my um <laughs> There's a lot. Come on, come on, Lauren. It has to be working with me and Nicolette in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure we're your yes. But... Yeah. That was definitely one of my shining moments. Um, so, <laughs> from a very traditional media relations and um, event coordination perspective, um, gosh, probably 10, 12. I don't remember how many years ago now. Um, so I, um, we did not state that I am based in Orlando, Florida. So I am in the midst of all theme park attractions and um, mm -hmm. had a client um, that um, was opening a new attraction at their theme park. Um, it's the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and they were opening uh, what's called the shuttle launch experience. It was the first new attraction in many, many years. And we got to do a lot of really cool PR things around that, including like a, a satellite media tour. Um, but I was young enough in my career to just, I think, feel like a big hotshot. Um, but uh, there was a moment when um, what, what we did in terms of gaining a lot of media coverage for this uh, launch, pun intended, was to invite previous astronauts to be the first to ride the, the, um, the attraction. Oh, cool. We okay. wanted to get their feedback as they were getting off of, of how realistic it was. And um, as we, you know, there was a little bit of ceremony before the attraction officially opened and the astronauts got to go on. And I vividly remember standing um, on a platform that was right before they would get onto the, the attraction itself and seeing um, 
Buzz Aldrin walking up to me and saying thank you for allowing him to be there. And I, I was like, you know, this is very cool. This is a really cool <laughs> our career yeah. <laughs> um and so i'm i'm glad i stopped to think about it then because even now like i look back on it all the time but um but that was a really cool one another one um is i this is just a funny one i was um uh working with this was at another uh theme park actually um at universal's city walk um i was working with the bubba gump shrimp company when they were opening a new mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that they did, I don't know if they still do this whenever they open a new restaurant, is they send a Forrest Gump impersonator to come do media <laughs> appearances. And so <laughs> the night before, we had like a VIP event at the restaurant, um, and then the following morning I needed to pick up the, um, the Forrest Gump impersonator to take him to a whole bunch of radio and TV interviews. And um, so I was with him the night before and I said, you know, I'll, I'll be at your hotel at six o'clock in the morning to pick you up. Um, do you want me to just call you when I get there? And he said, yes. And so then I said, okay, well, give me your phone number. So he gave me his phone number and I said, and what's, you know, what's your name so I can put it into my phone. And he, he never broke character. He was Forrest Gump the whole time. So <laughs> Forrest Gump in my, my contacts in my phone. But and then there I'll share go. one. I'll share still, one more. Do you still, ra do you still randomly? Do you still randomly text them? That's what I wanted. To know. I do not. No, I don't. The other <laughs> funny thing about that story is, um, I I want to say that it was like August or September that the restaurant opened, and he makes it a point to bring a box of chocolates to every media appearance. Um, but oh, just man. a box of chocolates in Central Florida in August. Um, so yeah. Stopping at every Walgreens and CVS, like it, you know right before we'd have a media appearance to pick up new like Russell Stover chocolates. I mean, you know, but you I, should have been like, let's buy, let's buy an ice cooler and just shove them in there. I know, I know, <laughs> if I had thought ahead. I, I wanna share one more thing. I think, I mean, those are fun ones. Um, this other one I think is just really relevant to what we're talking about. Um, this one happened more recently. I had, um, and we haven't even really addressed this, but one of the, um, one of the easiest ways to show value of public relations is uh, is when a, a, an organization is in a crisis scenario. Um, so, you know, one mm -hmm. of the things that I always try to get my clients to understand is that you don't want to wait until you're in a crisis scenario to start building goodwill about your company. Um, and so that's another selling point for PR. But um, I have a client that does a great deal of, you know, really good, normal public relations functions. Um, but they're in an industry that just, you know, it happens to intersect with the public a lot. And um, sometimes those are not always pleasant intersections. And so, um, gosh, a couple of months ago now, uh, one of the properties of this organization um, was being developed. And there was a stipulation in the development contract that said um, if they were going to be removing any trees, that they needed to replant trees elsewhere, to, you know, nearby, but if, you know, if you needed to put a road in, you could remove trees and, you know, and then they would plant the trees somewhere else. Um, so it's kind of like a carbon neutral agreement type thing. And, and it's very traditional in this industry. Um, but what happened was um, there was a group of, of I forget the, the name of them, but they essentially were a group of people who were, um, fighting to keep trees alive in that specific community and were very upset that, um, that there were trees being removed one day and, and were kind of staging a sit-in and you know, weren't gonna move. And I mean, it, it, it got pretty ugly um, just by the fact that like the, these people were very vocal. Um, and so very quickly, uh, we made the decision to have um, the, the representative for our organization go out and meet with them right on the site where, where they were kind of protesting. Um, and he brought with him the original documentation of what had been agreed upon and, and really just took some time to explain to them, you know, what was happening. And, um, and I've never seen this happen before and I'll probably never see it happen again, but by the five o'clock news, the, the main protester, the woman who was leading the, uh, the group that didn't want the trees to come down, was the only person interviewed on, uh, on several television stations, um, which of course makes my PR heart, PR heart very nervous, um, but she actually told our message. She you know, had 
literally been wow. turned around um, and, and really felt that the communication had changed, you know, her perception of what was happening. And, um, and so she, she got up there and told our messages, um, which, I mean, again, right back third party credibility, you really, I mean, it became a non story just because she was saying the same message as the developer. So um, that was just a real win, win all around. And, um, you know, we, we continue to stay in touch with that, um, that group and keep them posted on any sort of changes in development or anything that's moving forward just so that they feel like they're a part of the um, discussion but yeah that was that was a real win that's again I'll probably never see it again but that was <laughs> if you can yeah, get, that, if you can get is... the protesters to that mm -hmm. <laughs> right I know I'm like just it wasn't tell even your our, message right it wasn't even our talking head it, it was the, the protest right. So, yeah. Well, what what a, what a story! What a story of like you know uh, you know we talked about influencers early, but look yeah. at the you know look at how that how that protester wind up becoming an influencer pro for this organization or this yeah. you know this this uh, develop you know this building developer or um you know that's that's it, that's like uh, you know basically what you did is you swayed the influencer and they were able to now go and influence other people you know their right. own their own protesters that were along with them as well as everyone else that they were connected to via the news it's a great story yeah, well, and it also helped us develop kind of a template for how to deal with situations like this moving forward. I'm not saying that every time the protester is going to completely change their opinion and become our, our biggest spokesperson, but um, one of the things that I think the company was a little hesitant to do was to send out, the, you know, the big bad developer and say, like, here's our stance, here's what, you know, here's the paper that says we can do this, but um, he, had, he did it so tactfully and in such a way that um, that it really did make them feel like they were part of the process that it just goes to show you how far openly and honestly communicating with your audiences, um, whether they, you know, they be people who are for you or against you are, um, can be a, a really good point, um, a really good tactic to implement. That's awesome. So Great Lauren, story. is there anything else that you, you think we should know about PR or that everybody should know? Um, so yeah, I, I started to put together kind of a, a list of things that I, I would advise a company that's considering um, either implementing a PR function or you know maybe growing a PR function. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is taking a step back and really thinking strategically and not necessarily tactically. Um, you know, a lot of people can get mired in the day-to-day -day tactics of what public relations looks like, whether that be, you know, drafting and distributing a press release or working on an award nomination for somebody. Um, but if you really take a step back and look at the business objectives, whether, you know, oftentimes they're drafted annually, sometimes they're like five-year plans, but to see um, what those are and to really tie in every single PR objective to those, it's, it, become, it makes the, the PR function so much more um, appreciated usually, um, just because you know, you're not doing things willy nilly that aren't necessarily going to be impactful. Um, so just you know, spending time, um, focusing your efforts, um, it, it, it makes a big difference. The other thing is, I hear this a lot, um, especially because, um, you know, and, and I was one of them at one point, but there's a lot of young professionals graduating with degrees in PR or marketing or social media um, and all these different functions. Um, it's important for organizations to understand that somebody in the organization, whomever that, you know, it, it'll depend on the organization, but somebody needs to have a seat at the table who is in a communications function. Because one of the worst things that can happen is your organization gets completely blindsided by a crisis or a reactive situation, or just even gets kind of pulled into something that's, you know, happening in the industry and isn't necessarily like specifically related to your company. Um, and it's giving your organization, you know, it's putting your organization in a bad light. Um, PR professionals and, and strategic communicators will usually think about those things in advance. So you've got a plan in place. You've got, you know, some good counsel for, for when and if that does happen. 
Um, the other function of, of PR, I talked a little bit about this, is that listening function. Um, and so sometimes the PR professionals, um, I will tell you, I've been in, in boardrooms before where uh, PR professionals and, and attorneys don't necessarily see eye to eye. Um, but to prepare a company for um, kind of a soft landing approach when and if a reactive situation arises is usually super appreciated when it does arise. Um, sometimes you can put together crisis plans that are never used and those are the best crisis plans, but um, just to have a plan in place for should something happen um, and pre again, preparing the company for what I call kind of a soft landing so it's not super jarring, it's not something that nobody saw coming um, is, a, is a really important function of PR. And then, um, uh, let's see, so the, the one more thing about crisis plans, um, if you don't have one, you need to probably stop what you're doing and, and put one together <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> Things that need to be included in them, um, plans for a variety of potential scenarios, uh, you know, you really can't plan for exactly how it's going to go down, but in this day and age, if you are a workplace, I mean, you, you need to be prepared for, you know, what happens if, you know, something something happens amongst one of your employees, what happens for an, you know, active shooter situation, what happens if, um, you know, all of your data gets stolen and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's out there for somebody else to steal. Um, so you need to have just kind of a general overarching plan for what happens um, in those scenarios. You need to have a list of who's going to be contacted and when, you know, who within the company needs to know first, second, third, fourth, you know, what their emergency contact phone numbers are. Um, and then you need to have kind of organ organizational key messages that, you know, will work in a crisis, will work in, you know, any sort of media relations component. Um, and then the other thing I always say is kind of rinse and repeat annually um, because you don't know if somebody, if somebody leaves the company and they're the one who's listed as number two on the crisis plan, um, you know, you want to make sure that that's updated as, as often as needs to be. So, uh, and then the last thing that I usually tell people if they're interested in having some sort of PR function um, is to get a subscription to some sort of nationally regarded newspaper. Um, I, I get all of mine online, but I spend, or, yeah, I think a lot of people pick up their phone first thing in the morning and look at Facebook or look at Instagram. I usually spend a good 10 minutes looking at Wall Street Journal and New York Times just to see what's happening in the world. And, um, you know, if there are opportunities for me to share with my client base that, hey, this is an opportunity for us, or this is a threat to us, and we need to be prepared for it. Because um, I think a lot of times PR professionals can overlook, um, well, a lot of times organizations can overlook what's happening in the larger, you know, national and international scope. Um, and those could have been opportunities that you have, you, you could be a part of that story, or they could be threats to your organization that you need to be prepared for. Actually, really good advice because you're right. Most people yeah. do. They pick it up. Maybe they're checking their email. They're looking at Facebook. They're looking at Instagram. They're not really focused on well, what's really happening in the world. You know, mm -hmm. it's in their world, not in the world. And especially, right, when you're a business, you, you need to have that, that sort of more global view of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, because you never know when somebody's going to call you and say, you know, how do you feel about the tariffs or, you know, like that's the right impact millions of people. Um, and so yeah. you just don't know, like when you're going to get that kind of question and you need to be prepared for it and, and you need to know like how you actually feel about it. So being educated on it is the best way to do that. That's why we love Lauren because she's so thorough. <laughs> I know, Lauren, I know. Lauren's my favorite person. It's because I don't, I don't sleep. I just read the news. But one of the that's other right. things I thought I might be able to um, to that's, share that's, is that's because you look I, so close to the Disneyland. There's there's yeah. uh, light pollution everywhere. You know <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I don't know if if you guys would be interested in this, but I put together a list of some free tools that um, if somebody's interested in learning more about the PR function or in, in perhaps serving in that role within their organization, oh. I thought this might be a a nice thing to to include. Um, 
we talked about one of them, um, and I, I mentioned that I subscribe um, via paid subscriptions to New York Times and Wall Street Journal. But even if you don't want to go to that level, check the national headlines on your, you know, when you wake up, just to, you know, check Twitter to see what's trending in the world. Mm -hmm. So most, I, I think any like email database nowadays, like as soon as you sign in to the, whatever their homepage is, like they've got, you know, top headlines of the day or whatever, just know right. like, uh, spend some time so that you know what's going on in the world. And you can, uh, of course, do that for free. You don't necessarily have to have a subscription to the, yeah, the and it, yeah, send us, send us that list. And what we'll do is we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll awesome. publish it on the site, yeah. we'll publish it on the site for, for all the readers to look at, you know, yep. so that'd be, that'd be great, a great resource for everyone. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, kind of a low hanging fruit PR opportunity or, or award nominations. There's usually industry level award nominations. There's, um, all of the American City Business Journals have award nominations that are constantly rolling. So it's an, an easy way to get good publicity for your company um, if, you know, if you've got somebody who would be a good fit for that award nomination. And then there's another really great tool called Help a Reporter Out. And again, I'll give the list to you guys of all this, but it's H-A-R-O. Um, and basically what it is, is it's... Um, Journalists send in inquiries of store, you know, for resources for stories that they're working on, and you can respond to those so you know that they're, you know, actively working on those stories. Sometimes the um, they'll divulge which publication or which media outlet it's for. Sometimes they won't, but I find that a lot of times when they don't, it's the bigger ones. And so, um, so yeah, just being like early to hop on those and offering up somebody as a resource if, if it's a good fit for your organization mm -hmm. is a good way to um, to get some you know, some publicity. And on the flip side, from a content marketing perspective, if you're putting together content, you can serve as the journalist. And if yeah. you, you've got a good I'm, story I'm to tell. I'm actually super familiar with Harrow. I've yeah. gotten a lot of, a lot of great quotes there, but I didn't, I never thought of it on that, on the flip side, you know, that the PR folks are right. really, you know, scouring it, you know, oh, yes. to help their clients. Okay. Yep. Yep. And Google news alerts are the other thing that I always tell people to do, you know, you can, of course, put your company name in there, but you can also put your competitors' company names in there. You can put, you know, industry information. You can, um, you can put some keywords that you're interested in. And a lot of times, I am building out media lists based on what's coming through my Google News alerts because I know that those people are writing about or you know they're publishing about what I right, right. tell them. So, yeah. awesome. Brian, am I missing anything? I think Lauren no, covered the entire industry. So I, I don't, I, I don't think I, I did. missed anything. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you missed anything on this. Either, either one of you, it was, it was great. And Lauren, if I didn't say this, you, you have always been one of my favorite people to work with. Mm -hmm. Aw, thank you. It's, yeah. it's always fun. You guys are some of my favorite people to work with as well, so. Yeah. Well, brain's well, a little crazy, the, but that's all right. That's yeah, well, that's okay. That's, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to be, right? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for taking some time to talk to us today. And um, thank you we'll for having me. that resource with everybody. Yes, and that thank is you. all. And, oh, okay. and one, la one last thing I will leave um, with everybody with is if you feel like you're at the point where you might need help, with public relations. Um, one resource, I talked about them at the beginning of the session, um, is uh, the Public Relations Society of America. It's a, it's a national organization, um, but they do have some great resources on their website, which is prsa.org. And you can usually drill down by, um, by their like local or regional chapters. And if you're interested in perhaps hiring an agency or, or a solo practitioner, or even thinking about bringing on somebody in-house and you don't really know where to start, I would suggest reaching out to some of the leadership at the local level because they can help guide you on um, you know, understanding like what your needs are and marrying that with either an agency if it's a you know, big lift or maybe it's a solo practitioner if it's something that you know, they don't need that much, you know, like, a, a, you know, 40 hours a week, um, or maybe it's bringing somebody right. else who can serve a couple of different functions. And so I would reach out to a couple of people at the local or regional level and just kind of explain, you know, the situation that you're in. They can also help you understand like how, um, 
how you might pay somebody like that, you know, what the, the levels are mm -hmm. in a particular market. Um, and so I, you know, they're just a great resource and, and usually just very willing to help anybody who's considering a PR function. And, and if anyone missed that URL, what we will do is we'll, when we publish the free tools on the site, uh, oh, yeah. somnicap.com, what we'll do is we'll add a link to, to that uh, resource. That way you could take a look at it. Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, That's everyone, it. thank you for joining us. Feel free to visit us at insomnicat.com. And remember to subscribe to all of our channels. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.